All right. So let's just start off um, with background, your education, um, if you could introduce yourself and um, and how you got into the field. Okay. Uh, my name is Gayatri Fernando, and I have uh, two masters, one in theology and uh, one in English literature and a PhD in psychology. I'm uh, currently a licensed psychologist in the state of California and a professor of psychology at Cal State LA, and I'm currently the chair of the department. What is the first step in recovery and healing for someone who is able to move out of the trauma, or if they're still in the trauma? What what's that first step look like? I think if they're still in the trauma, that's really hard to you know to deal with. Um, for example, a person who's in an abusive relationship, um, they're still in the abusive relationship because they're afraid to leave. You know, the the most dangerous time for a woman who leaves an abusive man is right after she's left him. Um, you know, a significant proportion of women have been killed by their abusive partner right after they've left them. Um, so they have a reasonable fear of leaving that partner. And there may be other reasons why they don't leave. Um, there are lots and lots of videos and, and uh, stories about this that people can access on YouTube about why women don't leave abusive relationships. And it's not because they're stupid or they're too weak. There are very good reasons why they don't leave. But when they are in those relationships, um, you know, constantly being traumatized and re-traumatized, uh, it's really hard for a clinician to to work with because what do you say? Like you use cognitive behavior therapy to 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 say what's happening is not real, or you say, well, you know. Your number one concern should be for that person's safety, right? So you, they're very sort of basic therapies that you would have to do with somebody who's in a trauma and hasn't gotten out of it. Uh, that would be like, how do you keep yourself safe? How do you try to predict what this person will do? Like, you know, every relationship has those patterns where people can predict when this person is starting to become violent, won't stop. And it would be when the person starts using that substance, whatever that is, alcohol, cocaine. Uh, so in, in that moment, you work with your client to say, okay, first, your first priority has to be your safety. So what are the steps that you're going to take when this person starts the pattern where you know that at the end of it, you're going to get beaten up? You know, cognitive behavior therapy really is not going to be helping you at that moment. Um, if they, if you have supported them to the point where they do now have enough psychological and financial resources to, to leave, then you can begin the process of healing. So for people who have, who are post trauma, they have survived a war, they have survived torture, they have survived child abuse, uh, I do believe the first step would be to to talk to someone because I do believe that therapy can be very healing. Um, we I, I talk about making the nonverbal verbal. So in the biology of trauma, we know that what's activated uh, a lot is the amygdala. The amygdala is part of your limbic system and your limbic system is the part of your brain that works, it's a mid-level, so it's fairly deep into your brain as opposed to the surfacey areas of your brain. So in that mid-level of your brain, the, the further down we go and the further back we go, the more primitive we are, right? The, the less we have access to those areas. That's why you have those hot button issues where somebody says something to you and you respond like that and you think, why did I do that? It's because your amygdala is what was activated at that moment. And th those areas are not as accessible to you. So what therapy helps you to do is to take those limbic responses that are less accessible, move them over to your frontal lobe where they become more accessible. So your frontal lobe is that part of you that most distinguishes you from other animals. We are all animals. 
uh, but we like to think of ourselves as kind of the crowning glory of animals. And that's because we have frontal lobes that are very, uh, very well developed, far more developed than most other animals, even most other mammals, um, although we're, you know, the chimpanzees come pretty close. But, but, but we have the language then, right? And we have decision making and we have executive functioning all in the, that tiny part uh, of the prefrontal cortex. And so that's what I believe therapy helps you to do. It, it helps you to bring those inaccessible moments and emotions into a place where you can deal with them. And uh, the therapist is there to hear those words that come out from your client haltingly. Maybe they don't yet have the words for it, but they're struggling to, to, to make sense of what happened to them. And then when they put those words to the things that happen to them and trying to make sense of them, it, it does help them to then cope with it. It does then present some opportunities for how you might move forward, even with those horrible things happening to you. So your husband may have died very suddenly a month ago, and now you're left with a, an adolescent kid that adored the father, but didn't have a good relationship with you, you're talking to your therapist about it, you're using, you know, your, your, all your fears and your anxieties come to the fore here and in talking to your therapist and getting that feedback from your therapist and your therapist is reflecting back those anxieties and fears to you and you say, oh, actually it's not as bad as I thought or, oh my God, it's worse than I thought. I really better start doing something about it. Um, so I think that first step of reaching out and talking to someone is so important. And to my students who don't have the money for therapy or are suspicious of therapy, I tell them to even just talk into the mirror. Uh, try to do it when no one else is around because <laughs> then they might think that you need therapy really badly. But uh, just to be able to verbalize, to look at someone else's face, which your mirror face is, would be that someone else, and to just verbalize something uh, really does make a difference because you could live in your head and think about a stressor in a certain way, but when you start putting it into words, you realize either that that stressor wasn't as bad as you thought it was or that perhaps it really does require your attention because it's worse than you thought it was, or it's more severe or more attention worthy than you thought. Have you ever had those times when you thought like you hated somebody like maybe your professor and then you talk to somebody else about it and they said, dude, like chill, man. And then you go, oh yeah, I guess it's not so bad, right? Never my professor, Dr. Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, I've, I've definitely had those experiences. And I find that I was actually going to mention, because the mirror thing, in my car, when I'm driving sometimes in my car, I'll just have a therapy session with myself. I have a, a, a son, uh, and when he was going through his teenage years, um, I'm South Asian, and uh, if you really want to know, how a Sri Lankan mother is there. There is a video, a great video of, of two guys depicting their Sri Lankan mothers. Um, I think it's called Shit Sri Lankan Mothers Say. And it, it's just perfect because it as is really those things. We, we actually say all of those things. Like we, you know, we expect our children to obey us. Um, we are very loving and we give them all the resources, but there's no excuses. You know, there's no quitting school or there's no being sick. No, you just have to do it. And so in this culture where you are expect to pander much more to your children, uh, you can see how, you know, conflict can arise. And so I would be like, I can't believe this kid. He, you know, he doesn't go to, he didn't go to school again the other day. And one of my American friends would say, well, what are his grades? Uh, well, I guess they're A's. Then she goes, well, what are you worrying about? 
I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to go to school every day. You know, like don't sweat the small stuff, right? So just a friend, um, a religious figure, you know, many people trust their pastors and their imams uh, or their Buddhist priest to, to go and, and talk about what's going on with them. Uh, I think therapists do have particular training and a trauma therapist does have very specialized training. Um, and so I think it is helpful uh, if you need more than your nearer self to to go and get some sessions. Sometimes it could just be, you know, it doesn't have to be for the rest of your life. Um, you can have 12 sessions, 24 sessions, and in those sessions, hopefully the therapist gives you tools that you can then work with by yourself uh, because many of us don't have the money to go to therapy for a lifetime, right? And any change that you're going to make in your attitudes or your behaviors should occur somewhere between one year and 18 months so that if you're in therapy for six years and you're still exactly the same, I would, um, I would question your choice of therapist. You're probably too comfortable at that point. You know, it's okay to change therapists. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. I want to thank Dr. Fernando for joining me. Um, there's definitely more that we talked about. I'm going to split them up into different videos uh, pertaining to the category. Um, there's so much information involved, I, I just couldn't put it all in one video. I actually worked in Dr. Fernando's lab at Cal State LA. If you do have a chance to take her there, definitely do. She's a great lecturer, always interesting, always funny. Other than that, if you have any other ideas or recommendations that you'd like to see, go ahead and just leave them in the comments below and I'll try to make a video. Thank you so much. Have a great day.